Right. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to speak here. And I'm going to pick right up um, where we've just uh, ended. And that is the challenge uh, that Macron has posed for other European leaders. A challenge to respond to a new vision, a new idea as to where Europe should be going, which is something quite different from the European debates that we've had over previous years, where it was normal that European politicians, when asked about Europe, would pay lip service to European values, European ideas as to why the European Union exists, but there wasn't really a debate about where Europe should be going, and why we should be going in a certain direction. And so, as we've just heard, the challenge has been primarily to Germany. Um, and this is quite logical um, from the perspective of where the European Union came from. If you come from a Franco-German context, uh, where I've spent uh, a lot of time, you will have learned at school from very early on that the European project, essentially, at the start, was about reconciliation between France and Germany. And everything else that happened afterwards is a result of this reconciliation between those two countries. And we still see this very much in some symbols attached to the European project. The European Parliament, for better or worse, is still in Strasbourg, which is obviously a highly symbolical city for both countries and for the reconciliation between both after World War II. Obviously, today, the European Union looks very different. It's a European Union of 28, soon again 27. And obviously, the sort of value of the Franco-German axis in this European Union of 27 is very different from the original six countries that created the predecessor of the Un European Union. However, if you take a look at the demographic, economic weight, and also the political weight of all those two countries, it's still pretty clear that there's very little that can, done, can get done within the European Union without those two countries actually agreeing on something first. And so the challenge that Macron has posed for the relationship between those two countries is where Germany and France currently stand. There are a few terms that have been used for the relationship between the two over time. In, uh, in French, it's called the couple franco-allemand, the French-German couple. In German, we'd prefer the term of uh, French-German engine or motor, or perhaps the French-German tandem uh, that can drive European integration um, forward. So the focus of what I have been asked to talk about is really how is Germany picking up this debate on the future of Europe that was started by Emmanuel Macron, and why is it picking it up at a very slow pace? And the main argument uh, that I'm going to suggest to you, which I've also made uh, together with Brandon Sims in a piece for The New Statesman, is that on the one hand, it is a problem of different political styles, perhaps also language in the two countries. We've heard about Macron's style, which is very much regal in a certain sense, the, the places that he chooses to give his speeches, the language that he uses um, to deliver his ideas, which is very German, different from the German political context. And at the same time, and this is really a first in the history of the European Union, this also has to do with a profound crisis of the German political system. Um, it's not quite as profound a political crisis as some commentators, especially in Britain, uh, would make it out to be, but it's still been a hurdle uh, for Germany to respond to those ideas put forward um, by Emmanuel Macron. And so, to get back to the issue of uh, political style, um, one of the fundamentals of German policymaking, not just towards Europe, but in general, and especially under Angela Merkel's leadership, has been the idea that you don't rock the boat. Um, you find solutions when you need them. Uh, you don't come up with great visions. In fact, um, the late Chancellor um, Schmidt um, has a very famous quotation that German politicians love to use, which is, if you translate it, something along the lines of, well, those who have grand visions better consult a medical doctor, uh, and not enter politics. Uh, so this is a profound difference in political style between these two countries um, that has held up progress on this debate on the future of Europe to a certain extent. But this time around, I would argue that actually the main factor that is inhibiting uh, progress on this debate is what has happened in German politics. 
in recent years. So I'm going to turn now very briefly to give you a bit of an overview as to where German politics currently stand. I'm sure you've all followed um, the recent coverage of there being a political crisis in the government and so on and so forth. Um, but I just want to give you a bit of context as to where this came from and then turn to what this has meant for the reception of President Macron's proposals on the future of Europe. So what is happening in Germany? Well, let's start with the status quo, the sort of longer term status quo, um, where, well, pretty much everyone, not just in Germany, but also in the rest of Europe, will see Germany as one of the main beneficiaries of the European project. To many on what in Germany is called the European periphery, since the financial crisis, this has turned into perspective uh, where citizens will say, well, Germany effectively is run by Europe. It is to the benefit of Europe, um, which I don't quite uh, ascribe to, but it is a valid perspective to hold from Europe's uh, periphery, as it is called in Germany. Um, but how does this actually look like in Germany? Now, interestingly enough, if you take a look at polling data, how uh, political parties um, frame the European issue, well, you could think all is well. Um, Germans support the European project. The problem being that this has never been properly tested and for a reason. So unlike some of the other countries of the European Union, uh, in which the European question has constantly been put to referenda, uh, we've seen this, for instance, in France with the referendum on the Constitution, which failed. You've seen this on, a, on numerous occasions in this country on the East Treaty reforms, where the population was actually consulted about their views on the European Union. It failed. Um, on some occasions, that's why we don't have a constitution for the European Union right now, but Germany does not know public consultations or referenda, for good reason. Um, when Germany's contemporary political system was set up by the Allies after World War II, there was a fear that bringing in those elements of direct democracy uh, could lead to unforeseen consequences. So Germany has been very shy about actually introducing any kinds of element of direct democracy. So the European question has never been asked um, in the German electorate. So it's never been a primary concern for the German population or for German politics. And this is a change that we're seeing right now. Uh, with the federal election of the autumn of 2017, where well, Europe was very much a subject for debate um, in the campaign, um, but not in a way that many would have expected. Um, because here, for the first time, the sort of general consensus on Europe was rocked by a new political actor, which is the, the AFD, the Alternative for Germany. You probably all have heard about it, which is a new radical right-wing uh, political party, which for the first time in history entered parliament in those federal elections in the autumn of last year. And this is the first challenge to Germany's established political system. Now, in the federal parliament, there's six political parties represented which makes it awfully difficult to govern with a majority, to form coalitions in that setting, and so on and so forth. Um, and the key aspect of this political party entering parliament was its position on European questions. And there are two main issues uh, that this party, this populist party, kept mentioning um, in the debates and also in electoral campaigns for the lender uh, in recent years. Uh, the first one is, sorry. Could you speak just a little more slowly? Sure. <laughs> um, right, so there are two elements that have brought this political party um, into uh, the federal parliament. The first one dates back to the financial crisis um, and Germany's reaction to uh, Greece's and other countries' need for a bailout. And in the German public debate, uh, this was seen as a sort of first step towards European countries taking financial responsibilities for the other. And ever since then, um, German economists and political actors on the right wing of the political spectrum have um, had a fear, um, and this is a very profound fear in German political debates, that German money would have to pay for others' mistakes. And this is the first part of this platform of that political party that emerged out of that, the AFD, which didn't exist beforehand. 
uh, this opposition to taking financial responsibility for other European countries. And the second element is obviously the decision in 2015 uh, at the height of the migration crisis of Angela Merkel to take in refugees that were en route to Northern Europe, to sort of facilitate um, their journey into Germany and possibly onwards to other Northern European countries. And ever since, German political debate has changed profoundly. Um, whereas beforehand, we never have seen a political actor to the right of the Christian Democratic Party, which is a sort of center-right uh, Christian um, Democratic Party, the AFD rose as a result of this, altering the public debate, speaking of a German government that has committed treason against its own people, that wants to change the ethnic makeup of the population, and so on and so forth. So both of these factors were European in nature. One, having to do with the Greek bailout and the consequences of that. And secondly, the migration crisis. Now, obviously, those weren't the only um, European issues to, do, to be debated at the time. Um, but the problem was that German public debate ever since has been about those two issues. Um, if you take a look at um, the kind of political talk shows that happen on German television, uh, there were some pretty interesting statistics recently. Uh, more than 50% of them have been about the issue of migration in the last three years. There are obviously lots of other issues that the country is facing. It's aging rapidly. Um, there are problems with public infrastructure, public spending. Uh, it is facing a labor shortage. Um, but those have been the main issues of public debate in the country since then. And that led to an election result in the autumn of last year, where we now have six political parties represented in the parliament, one of them being fundamentally opposed to the European Union as we know it, um, to German policy making as we know it, as a sort of moderate pro-European voice in world politics. And so one of the first challenges at this point was how do we stabilize the political system again? Um, so far, Germany has only known coalitions of two political parties. The majorities were always such that in the parliament there were no more than four or five political parties. Um, now we have six. So initially, in the autumn of last year, what has happened is that three political parties tried to form a government. This would have been a very interesting government between Christian Democrats, so the center-right, the Green Party, which has its um, origins in the sort of um, anti-nuclear energy, pro-environmental, and also very left-wing uh, political movements in the country, but has become gradually more mainstream, and the liberal party of the country. But those talks failed at the last minute. And so, for the first time in the history of contemporary Germany, Germany found itself in a similar position as Belgium, as Spain, uh, at some point in time, um, without a government for not a substantial amount of time, but still an amount of time that prevented the European agenda from moving forward. Now, in the end, German government was found, much like the German government that was uh, in government beforehand, which is essentially a grand coalition. So the center-right and the center-left entered together into government. They have more than 50% of the seats in parliament. So there is no problem there. And for a moment, it even looked like that the Social Democratic Party, which had in the last election as its candidate, someone who was very well known to a European political sphere, in fact, he used to be president of the European Parliament, Martin Schulz, um, that this Social Democratic Party negotiated an agreement between the two parties that would see Europe at the heart of the debates for the government. In fact, the first pages of the coalition agreement between the two only talks about Europe. The problem being that the Social Democratic Party lost a large part of the vote share and thereby was an internal crisis as well. So the political personnel which negotiated Europe as a core part of a future German government actually disappeared to be replaced with new political actors. So Germany found itself after the formation of the government earlier this year, 
in a position where there was an agreement between the two main political parties in the country on running a coalition government that would put European questions at the center, but it was left without the personnel in the Social Democratic Party that actually wanted to put Europe at the center. The party had negotiated sort of more powers, important ministries, uh, to be able to put this agenda forward, but now the people sitting in those ministries weren't the one that actually had those European ideas in mind. So this is the setting of Germany early this year. And then, as of a month ago, three weeks ago, you probably have heard of a profound governmental crisis uh, in the country that almost brought this new government to brick. Because, in fact, Germany is a very odd country when it comes to its politics. Because it's obviously a federal state, which means that politics don't just happen in Berlin, they also happen at the state level. So in reality, the government that Germany has is not between two political parties, but three. Um, because the conservative party in the country is made up of two different ones. One contesting in 15 out of the 16 states of the country, and then one just running in Bavaria. Now, I'm not going to get into the history of this, but the political party in Bavaria, which has a slightly different name from the one in the rest of the country, is facing state elections this year in the autumn, one year after the federal election of 2017. And the threat of the AFD, sort of right-wing populism, obviously hasn't gone away with the recent uh, election. It's there to stay. It is still shaping public discourse. So what has happened in recent weeks is that a political party that's part of the government at the federal level has tried to change Germany's migration policy unilaterally from this part of the government um, in order to win back voters from the extreme right in its own elections coming up in the autumn. So Germany finds itself in a very odd predicament right now. So it has a government at the federal level that is a lot more unstable than any government that the country has seen in the past. And at the same time, it's also destabilized at the regional level uh, because their elections coming up in Bavaria, and in fact, their regional elections, pretty much on an annual basis in the country. So, whereas Germany in the past has been called this anchor of stability in Europe in turmoil throughout the financial crisis, we can't really take this for granted anymore um, because we don't know what's going to happen after the elections in the autumn of this year, um, where most likely the Conservative Party in Bavaria will face an electoral defeat because their strategy of sounding like populists, according to the polls that we're seeing right now, isn't quite playing out. Why would you vote for a political party that is copying populists when you have the original? So in polling data, this political party is facing a large electoral defeat. So in the autumn of this year, we might see another political crisis in Germany that might once again bring the current government at the federal level uh, to a standstill maybe even to a failure. So Germany no longer is this country that can be taken for granted, that is moderately pro-European, that doesn't have visions, but that still, when something needs to be done, is in favor of getting something done. And this is the reality that President Macron had to face when putting forward his proposals for the reform of the European Union. And the initial plan, as I understood it, of the French government was that his proposals would have to become part of any discussion in Germany on a future government because he made those proposals in the big Sorbonne speech that we've heard about right after the German election. So any political party in Germany talking about a future program for a government would have had to read through those proposals and to take a position on that. Well, the problem was that while this was very carefully timed in France to give this speech, and in fact politicians from all over Europe were invited to that speech, Germany just couldn't react. There was no German government. So whereas the expectation was that Germany would be able to react immediately in a new government to those proposals, in fact, four, five months had to pass before Germany even had the government that could talk or respond to the vision um, of the French president. So that is the backdrop of Germany. Obviously, there are others 
Uh, when we talk about Europe these days, we have to consider numerous crises happening at the same time. We've talked about a liberal democracy yesterday. We can talk about the new Italian government. There's another crisis of the Eurozone looming with said government that is questioning some of the fundamentals of how the Eurozone is running. So we're now in a situation where something needs to be done. And the German and French motor, couple, whatever you want to call it, should be at the heart of this. But the German government isn't quite as stable as it has been in the past. And there isn't really an appetite for a grand debate of Europe ahead of the election in Bavaria. Because right now, if you're trying to frame the European issue, it is still very much about bailouts of poor European countries and the migration question. So those are the core issues that come up in German public debates. Still, there's this reality of something needing to get done. So Angela Merkel took her time to react to the French president. And then there was, in fact, a reaction in an interview that she gave to a major German newspaper. And then things happened really quickly up to a summit in June of this year, where the two actually sat down uh, close to Berlin and talked about European reform. And the core problem here is that um, German political reality really clashed with the French vision of where Europe should be going. So if we go back to those six sovereignties that Europe needs to be about, only two were really addressed symbolically in that meeting between the two uh, heads of state and government, one being about the issue of the Eurozone and creating more stability for the Eurozone. And I'm just giving you a few examples of how far apart the two governments really are. So the French government's position is that in order to stabilize the Eurozone, there needs to be a proper budget for the Eurozone. There needs to be a European finance minister uh, to be responsible for said budget. And that budget needs to be relatively large, given that the Eurozone is a currency union, um, and thereby it is an important political project. The German pri political priority, well, Ideally, we would not like to talk about any kind of Eurozone budget. If we do have to talk about it, let's make it as small as possible and not call it European Finance Minister. So the fudge that came out of that meeting was that there would be a Eurozone budget, but the size of the Eurozone budget would be decided in the future. So political symbol we're going to have in a Franco-German proposal, a Eurozone budget, but nothing is really agreed. So it's just a political symbol. The other key question that they addressed, um, and that is something that is very much in the European debate, as we've heard this morning, is the flagship project on European defense. And here as well, there was a symbolic project with Germany signing on to a French initiative that is called the, the European Intervention Initiative. But here as well, we're seeing something really interesting happening. Once again, the French vision of what this is supposed to do is completely different from the German vision. And here, this is really about language and different cultures of, of where things should be going. When Germany is talking about military uh, issues, it always considers this issue of parliamentary control, of restraint, uh, and similar things. So Germany signed up to a proposal knowing fully well that it couldn't commit to anything of the kind that the French president imagined. French vision, on the other hand, is that the European procedures that we have a way too cumbersome to do anything in political crisis, so we need to facilitate where this should be going. So once again, there was a symbolic agreement that Germany would sign up to this French project, but if you look into the details, not much has happened. And this is really where we're standing with this debate right now. There's no appetite in Germany to actually address any of those issues, yet the German government knows it needs to be seen as doing something about them. So there are symbolic concessions being given. And meanwhile, the French government's proposal is, in reality, hung out to dry. And there is no actual response to this. And to finish, um, this could get even more interesting with uh, the European Parliament elections next year, which we've heard a little bit about um, already. Um, because any kind of significant debate on the future of Europe, where, should, where it should be going, obviously would need a public mandate um, to bring this through. And here again, there is a substantial difference between the sorts of 
ideas prevalent in France as to how one can construct such a majority uh, and such public support for this, and the German position. For Germany, ideally, nothing should change in the European elections. Um, already the changes that we've seen the last time around, that there was a sort of public electoral campaign uh, on who was going to be the next head of the European Commission is a bit too much for the German uh, government. On the French side, there's obviously this appetite to construct a large coalition around the idea of European reform, bringing progressive forces uh, together to do that. But this obviously fundamentally puts the two at odds. Um, just to give you an idea, um, France and the, well, En Marche in this case, would have to choose someone in Germany to be uh, their ally uh, in the European Parliament elections. Well, who do they choose? Well, if you form a new political party, that's clearly an interference in the domestic politics and the domestic structures of the country. If you ally yourself with an existing political party, then you can't really put your vision um, in practice. So obviously, um, the French project has very much been seen as a liberal project, but if you take a look at the German Liberal Party, it is a liberal party, but on Europe, the positions are completely different. If you take a look at the German Social Democrats, well, obviously, they're quite content in being part of that large grouping of socialists and democrats in the European Parliament. So here again, there is a potential for a clash of cultures between the two. And so the big issue that the current situation in Germany poses to this is that we've lost valuable time um, with this initiative to reform the European Union, with putting those ideas out to public consultation, to public debate, ahead of the parliamentary elections of 2019. Well, we're now less than a year away from those, and the German government only reacted uh, a few weeks ago, and those proposals have only been over uh, on the table since then. So I fear, as with many of those initiatives to change something in the European Union, the reaction could be considered as too little too late. And so I'm probably going to end on, on a slightly grim assessment of where this is going, that the French proposal was something fresh, was something new for the European de debate that we need. People have started debating about Europe in a completely different setting again. But the political realities, not just in Germany, but also in other European countries, have meant that this is probably not the time to be having that debate. Uh, because domestically, uh, when you mention the issue of Europe, uh, the population, or at least political parties, will currently be framing it in a way and saying, well, Europe is about migration and it has failed us about migration. Europe is about countries acquiring too much debt and it has failed us in respect to making sure that no country uh, acquires so much debt and needs to be bailed out. Um, and all of this, as a grim assessment, is obviously happening at a point in time where we would need a debate on what Europe should be about and what the values of the European Union should be um, more than ever. If you think about the issue of defense that uh, the French president has mentioned as one of those issues or security for European sovereignty, well, one of the core pillars of security on the European continent is being put into question. Uh, that is NATO. If you think about the other core pillar of the European Union, which is to provide prosperity through an opening of economies and ultimately through international trade, that pillar is also in damage with um, the government in the United States questioning the fundamentals of international trade. So now we would need more than ever a debate about what Europe should be doing for us, where it should be going, and how it could protect those fundamental values. But the problem is that the way in which it is framed, not just in Germany, but in other countries, is that you can't actually be having those debate or face electoral defeat. So I fear in the current political climate, the sort of courageous response by the campaign of uh, Emmanuel Macron to actually turn around the rhetoric um, is probably going to be an isolated one because I don't see any other existing political party, at least in Germany, um, to be as courageous, to sort of completely change the rhetoric on, on Europe and saying, well, um, the issue isn't about migration, it's about what Europe has done for us and what Europe can do for us in the future. 
but I don't really see anyone stepping up and doing that. So I think France might very well be the exception for the foreseeable future.